God, have you ever Will. Been, have you ever been frustrated by paperwork? By Not ever. I, I love it. In fact, that's why I go to work. I don't. I don't care about my job. All I want to do is process forms and make sure the processes work really well. <laughs> I, I'm I am sensing, the king of the bureaumancers. I should have announced that later, but I am the king of the bureaumancers. I'm All sensing I a everything. little bit of sarcasm here that perhaps maybe forms aren't your dream. Uh, paperwork, not your dream? It shits me so royally that I actually <laughs> would think about killing sprees, but luckily guns aren't legal in Australia. <laughs> okay, all right. I'd kill a paper, not people. I love people. People are wonderful. Fair enough. Well, um, in 1975, uh, Lal Bihari, uh, this guy here... Oh, yeah. Walked into the revenue office at as Azamgarh District Headquarters in Uttar Pradesh, India. Now, as a, f- um, a farmer from a small town called Amilo, the 20-year-old Bihari was stopped. Um, he was stopping into the revenue office because he needed proof of identity uh, to take to the bank to apply for a loan. But mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. everyone filling out a form ever, he hit a snag. His snag was that he was dead. Take a look at yourself, insisted the Lekpol, which is a word for low-level bureaucrat who, uh, who kept the appropriate books for this. It's yeah. all written here in the registry. Now, this, of course... Obviously, sir, you, you are not alive. You are dead, sir. You, you can't, know how I know? Look at this book. In the books. You cannot have your identity documents because you are dead. Sorry, Mr. Bihari. You cannot... See, this is my version of hell and also instant insanity. Like, if I walked into a place where they meant it, I would, I would go instantly barking mad. So he was, he was a little bit more upset by this because the guy that was talking to him behind the counter uh, was actually a friend of his. Um, who he had tea he had tea with just the other day. Like he said to him, but I had tea with you. And he said to him, I'm sorry, Mr. Bihari, but you are dead. So eventually he did what some What kind of tea was it? I don't know. Well it wasn't ghost tea. It wasn't the kind of tea that would turn you into a ghost or anything like that. He Yeah. Um he did some probing. And eventually the story came out that unbeknownst to Lal, uh, Lal Bihari, uh, his uncle had gone into the registry office a little while ago and bribed another official, we don't know who, uh, 300 rupees to register Lal Bihari as dead. So that the and 300 dust, rupees is about eight cents, right? Uh, $20, 20 30 $40, oh, okay. something in, in that sort of, it's, it's a non-zero amount of money. Okay. Um, and and in uh, where he lives in Uttar Pradesh, it's probably a solid amount of money. Uh, right. In fact, in fact, actually, um, it's half the price uh, of no, actually twice the price that you would uh, pay someone uh, to murder someone. So a hitman would probably oh god ten bucks. <laughs> a probably a hitman would probably be three uh, hundred and fifty rupees, according to some people. I I am not an expert. Friends, on, oh, well, on, acquaintances, well, someone I heard of. I read it on the internet, dark web, really. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But yeah, in that area, obviously you'd have to pay for flights. If you how long ago were we? Seventies, uh, nineteen seventy-five. Uh, you'd so kill someone for ten bucks, probably. Uh, probably. Look, so this now is, that's got to be what one fifty. This is Uttar Pradesh in the nineteen seventies, so uh, money was different back then. <laughs> Hit manning was different, and so so also were the registry <laughs> offices. I think. <laughs> um, Bihari, Bihari, of course, uh, didn't give up. He, he felt he was alive. He, he didn't want to give up on this fact of being aliveness. And so he Did called... he have evidence, though? I mean, just because he felt it doesn't mean it's true. <laughs> I don't know what evidence you would, you would, you would provide. Feel opinions. I mean, this is what's killing us today. So <laughs> He contacted his lawyers and they told him, look, sir, it's not actually... We don't our... do corpses. <laughs> <laughs> get out, get out. <laughs> Sorry, mate, you've got to be more alive. He said, they said to him, this is actually sadly not that unusual um, and fighting it in court could take some time, sir, so perhaps don't bother. And he was like, no, I, I kind of want to um, bother. I, I kind of want to be alive here. Uh, as we he, did a, is there a cost-benefit analysis on being dead? Like are there tax advantages, for example? There are some advantages, which I'll tell you about. I'll tell you about al Bihari much later. Um, okay. But there, there are one or two small advantages to being dead. A lot, a lot, a lot of downsides. In fact, mm. he found he found uh, twenty thousand people over time uh, in India in similar circumstances. Wow. But um, the the thing that this all hinged on uh, was a very different innovation. It was an innovation that uh, came to pass three hundred years ago in the Black Death in Europe, and I want to explore a little bit about that.
Welcome to The Wholesome Show, the science podcast for people who are alive who set up the back of the classroom. What, why do we have to be alive, racist? I can't believe it. Against dead people. In which, this show, we ask the uh, pointless questions so that you, our very dear listeners, all three of you, don't have to. I'm Will Grant. I'm Dr. Roderick Griffin Lamberts. And you know what, Will? I've given up. I agree with Donald Trump's uh, head of communications. Let's not let the science get in the way. That's my new motto. Let's just not let it get in the way. I'm ha- I've had enough science getting in the way, so we're going to talk about that in amongst your story. Excellent. I'm, I'm very glad to hear that. And we are joined today by Dr. Anna Greta Hunter. Anna Greta, welcome. Hi, thanks so much for having me. What well, an extraordinary opportunity. <laughs> well, don't thank yeah, us I now. I wouldn't, thank us. I, I wouldn't thank us before it's over. You, never, you might want to retract that. Uh, Anna Greta is a physician, a cardiologist, and a climate-focused public policy advocate, fighter. Uh, yep, fair, fair way to describe it. Uh, my favourite job title that I have at the moment is that I'm the Human Futures Fellow. Oh, excellent. So ask me about the human future, and I can make things up about what we think might, might happen in the future. So you don't actually know. Make things up based on solid um, evidence. Make, making things up on the basis of science, on the basis of imagination, on the basis of all sorts of potential predictions. As and long I as don't the science know. doesn't get in the way. I don't want I it getting don't. in the way of what I really want. Oh, that's right. We're not doing science today. We're just going to do yep, predictions. Yep. Well, look, I, 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 I want to yep. draw on some of your predictions for the future and maybe some things that we might need to do uh, in the future. Uh, that might help us have the better versions, not the worse versions, not the Trumpian when, when, versions. When's the fu- is the future tomorrow? The future is happening now, isn't it? Whoa! Whoa! Uh, well, our listeners are experiencing they're they're experiencing our past, but they're uh, well, they're for, experiencing for their us uh, their future is their future. Our, is our past. So, so they'll know if we're right or not. I feel time like we need Professor Holt to explain. We're right. That. We really we do. We need somebody. D- densely into physics at this point in time. Yep. Or we need Doc Brown from um, Back to the Future. Yeah, yeah. Well, that would make everything better. Yeah. The Wholesome yeah. Show is brought to you by the Australian National Centre for the Public Awareness of Science. And or Denial of Science, because we've had enough. Uh, maybe, maybe. Talk to the boss about that one. All right. She's not here. I want to, to talk to you about the thing that got Lal Bihari into trouble. And being dead. Being dead. Yeah, uh, no. No, not being dead. Not being dead. But, but to do that, said so. I'm going to go a long way back. I'm going to go back to 1347. Mm-hmm. In 1347, the Black Death broke out in Europe. By 1351, just four years later, uh, a third, or perhaps more, we don't have great records, of all of Europeans were dead. <laughs> But we got you enough to know. Great records is a wonderful understatement. Well, we don't have great records. No, but th- there are some records. There's definitely, there's definitely, <laughs> as I'll come to in a second, quite a few records. There are some records. Th- yeah. There definitely are records from that period that will tell us a lot of people died. We can also, we can also uh, look at uh, churchyards, how full they are from that little period, uh, mass graves, other kinds of things. But a lot of people died. Uh, a lot worse than COVID. But um, ah, COVID's not over. Well, exactly. And um, we do know that someone died of uh, the Black Death, uh, the bubonic plague, uh, just this week. So not... From eating a marmot. It sounds so delicious, though. They literally ate a marmot. And I'm thinking, yeah, I'm, that's the same thing. I'm thinking that'd be kind of moist and tender, like, a, like eating corn, but only in meat form. I, I, I hear the word marmot, and I think, oh, is that that spread? Like there's Vegemite, Promite, yes. and marmot. Yes, it is. A little bit of fur in it, though. You get it after you've finished eating it. So... With a huge percentage of the remaining population both infectious and terrified, uh, the plague turned the formerly private experience of death, or at least the you know the burials, families, and churches, uh, into a matter of extreme public concern. So, mm. for the first time ever, governments, or you know what they were at the time, they're not what we would call governments, but kings and their courts, became interested in the health of the public. So how did governments start responding to this? In Italy, um, they developed something that we've been now using still in COVID. They invented quarantine. Cocktails. Oh, uh, quarantine. Okay. <laughs> yes, they, they invented uh, sourdough baking. I don't know. And the daiquiri. <laughs> <laughs> Buongiorno. Well done. Yes, yes, they invented quarantine. This is not quarantine. a story, this is not a story yes. about quarantine. Um, no. In the, um, their goal there was to track the living and enforce a lockdown on, on where people were. England took a different route and began tracking the dead. Uh, the theory was 
that if you tracked the people uh, where people died of the plague, then you could put up little posters. They looked something like this. This is an act, this is from much later, but it looks awesome. It's the it's the coolest looking poster I've ever seen. That's a, I finally found out what my first tat's going to be. I, I thought that exactly. So this is a bit back this tat is, too. These Full are back. bills of mortality. This one is so. For, just just before you go on, how many people could read? Uh, enough. Actually, actually, literacy was um, far higher back then than people um, normally expect. Than, than today in England. Yeah, but but also yeah. there there would definitely be people uh, a person in each street that would be able to to read enough to be able to know what's what going on. What a job. On. Oh, I'm the street reader. <laughs> I read for everybody up down the street. <laughs> I like that they, they turned Cornish just then. That was a that was a great Cornish accent. Um, was it? It was. It was. Who knew? That yeah. means that's five accents I can do. But anyway, uh, yes, as Rod said, these these bills of mortality. So this one that I've I've got a picture on is a amazing looking thing. It Isn't really it? does look like someone has to have this as a back tat because it just looks so cool. There's skulls. There's skeletons. There's um, uh, all sorts of great stuff. This one is from 1664. But, mm. uh, but the, the, they started in the plague years basically with the idea that they would write down and put on a, on a wall, on a, on a pole or something like that, if they had, I guess they had poles. Um, I think poles had been invented by the 1300s. I don't know. Uh, where people had died of the plague. So they would, they would um, be broken down by parish and they would list the plague dead and the other diseases dead. So, so th- these are essentially warnings. It's happening here. Stay away. Yeah, yeah, basically, uh, which is, okay. um, you know, a pretty. Uh, we still use that as well. We still uh, this is this is the precursor to all of the maps that we're seeing right now in in COVID times, uh, mapping where the outbreak spreads are. That is that is the Crossroads Inn right now, or the um, no, that's or, or Florida. App. So the poll with that poster is an app. Yes, indeed. We've we've updated some better of that. than the government app, but yes, it's an app. I'm thinking it's not on a poll. I really don't know if there were polls. I really, I've, I've just looked it up, um, and street lighting didn't start obviously until many, many hundreds of years later. Indeed. I'm really, I'm not sure that there was a poll. I'm thinking it's on a wall. That's what I'm thinking. Oh, just see, for the record. Did they it have controversial early? Didn't did they, they have <laughs> miscellaneous yeah, polls? I, yeah, I mean, interjecting. Sorry. No, yeah. interject all all. Uh, we, we don't do that. We don't do that on this. Uh, I, I noticed. So. So, so this was actually a big innovation. No earlier civilization that um, the pole? <laughs> not the pole, no, not the, the, pole. The, the bills of mortality. The wall, the, the wall, the, the wall. wall. The wall uh, was a big innovation. Those yeah. rich bastards with their walls and <laughs> bits of paper. Yep. None of them had kept systematic track of the dead. No, not the ancient Egyptians, no. as much as they loved funerals, uh, nor the Greeks or the Romans. And again, the Romans loved books. So um, none of them kept systematic track of the dead. Even, even uh, Christian civilization uh, in the medieval period wasn't terribly interested in it. They certainly were interested in, in, in death in terms of burial. Um, sure. they, they would list it on parish books, but they weren't interested in what people died of. They would. Um, oh, so they tra- they tracked but, deaths, not causes. Yes, and they counted them, didn't they? They knew how many people were dying. Yes. So in they a parish, didn't why they died? Not at all. Not at all. Right, and right, so this right. is actually or, a pretty big thing. Put down to the emperor. Yeah, it's um, yep. death is just a thing that God ordained, or or that happened, or that whatever it is. And a church would certainly be interested in saying this week we held, you know, this many baptisms and this many burials, and that would give you a great picture of um, the population of a village and how much it's going up or down. But they didn't track anything in terms of of how anyone died. So that to be fair, I bet they didn't track why they were born either, though. I mean, it was balanced. It was like we don't track why they died, we don't track why they were born, because to talk about that would be to talk about. <laughs> Dirty things. The, the dirty, th- uh, sure, sure. Dirty uh, things at both end of life, and we can't talk about either because the good Lord said no. So the earliest one that people can find um, is from 1512, uh, which stated that in the city of London, between the 16th and 23rd of November, 34 people died of the plague, and 32 died of, and I hear I have to break out the Cornish accent because it's written in Cornish. Go on. 32 died of od- odder diseases. So uh, odder. Uh, odder, odder, odder diseases. Okay. Yep. Uh, there was there was no other information about. Um, said, I got I got I got to interject that that accent right that that's the best accent you've ever done. It proves that accents can be genetic because you come from that fair country. I do come not, from that not Cornish land. 
but the United Kingdom. Well, I do. Well, like genetically, I come from the Cornish land. Best accent you've ever done. Oh, thank you, thank you. I, I, I yeah, I was two in, words in a single word, encapsulated in one <laughs> single word. I know. Quite extraordinary. I know. All right, well, all right. right. I'm, I'm quitting accents now. I'm quitting. No, no, this is an emotional <laughs> moment for me. I'm so proud. Um, now, um. What, uh, so this was a, a big innovation. So um, recording that there were people died of the plague and that was quite useful at the time. Mm. But in this original form, um, it, wasn't, it didn't achieve all that much. But in the 100 years after they were introduced, um, they started to modify them and they started to make them into something that was foundational to modern public health. So mm. in 1603, mm. uh, the bills began appearing weekly rather than just randomly when someone felt like doing it. Um, and so what that gave us is actually, it's, it's one of the richest data sets of deaths that we've got. Uh, where, where are we in terms of, I don't know if you know this, maybe I'm getting, you know it as well, but like the, where are we in terms of the printing press here? Like this would have been a big effort to be printing stuff and putting it out there, surely. Yeah, still. Guten, just... Gutenberg was, oh, look, I should know this. Um, I think 1500s sometime. Yeah, Dude. yeah. Uh, so I think the plague ones were handwritten. They have to have been handwritten. Could well be. I mean, you could, ima- yeah. you could imagine a, um, a cleric uh, doing enough to, you know, if, if you're putting it on a wall, you don't need to print out a thousand copies. You can write down three of them and put it well, on. Well, they only had four walls. There's a new innovation. We've already discussed that. But so they don't <laughs> And a poll by this time. They might have had a poll. This is when the monks were doing all the writing, weren't they? So yeah. You get a monk yeah. to do it. Yep. Yeah, so um, yep. let's let's assume that. But that's that, no mean feat, is what I mean. Like to, to actually be mm. producing these things is is not nothing for us. We're like, yeah, print up something and stick it out there. Of no course, worries. everyone writes. Everyone has access to the materials to do it. No biggie. So that in itself, just a moment, you know. Well done, ancient people. Yep. Back to you, William. Then, in 1629, during a lull in the plague, uh, the court of King James the first ordered a second innovation. So at this point, he ordered the parish clerks, so these are the people doing this writing down, to start listing the, the deaths from other causes as well. So not just Ooh. generic other. Yeah. Let's start looking at what else happened. Now, this is huge, and I want to look into the impact of this. But before the, we do that, I, I need to, this is something I've been yearning to do for ages, look at some of these odder diseases. Uh, Thank you so much. because My favourite disease, dropsy. <laughs> dropsy. Dropsy. I've always wanted to die of dropsy. It's just great. No, Anna Greta. Well, I, I still, I, I, the, I, I have the odd patient where we discuss dropsy, where we treat the dropsy that we see for in front of us. It's oh quite an God. extraordinary thing. Yes. It's still this called is, dropsy. No, very few people know what what dropsy might be. What is what it, is dropsy? Guys? Is it like why, the shoe? Why do you want to have dropsy? Yeah. Is it like the shoe shoe? The shoe shoe. I don't know what the shoe shoe. Well, it's like the horn. It's like the horn. You got the horn, the dropsy, or the shoe shoe. You can't be sure. I'm going to okay. come back to dropsy in a bit. Anna Greta, you can give give us an explanation for that. I want the Latin bit. name whenever but you're ready. But, Rod, I'm going to put you in a hard position here because you're literally going against a physician here. But I have a list of, it's on. of other diseases <laughs> from... Hey, um, hey, hey. Honours degree in medical anthropology. <laughs> I think I've got yeah, the win. No, so these are, and I usually lose at the trivia. So these are from I, the 1600s. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and they are all things that people died of. So these are things that people have, have listed as death. Now, what I'm going to mm-hmm. do, I'm, I'm going to read out the, the name and see if you can work out what the the modern uh version of that of that illness or debilitating condition oh i could do this all day i don't know if i'll win but i could do it all day (laughs) all all right um let's start with um cut of the stone cut of the stone stone. as a disease it's not actually a disease this is it's a it's a condition that is caused and um this is what they died of cut of the stone died of cut of the stone I assume they put stones in their gruel by accident and they swallowed it and it cut them internally in the esophagus on the way down. There's my guess. Okay. I agree. You got anything? No, I'm thinking it's some form of sepsis. Uh, no, uh, I don't believe so. Um, oh, actually it is. It is. So oh, it's, one it's, nil. One it's nil. caused by um, surgery uh, to remove a bladder stone. Mm-hmm. And mm. and then the death oh. death due to death due to surgery, seeing as yep. uh, life expectancy after surgery was pretty low at this point. Uh, I like they blame the stone, not the surgeon or the procedure. Oh, it's the thing we tried to pull out. Yeah, you know, that's what caused it. <laughs> yep. He, he um, died because of his heart. King, what, what, what year are we in at the moment? Uh, We're in- these are these are these from are um, uh, very. I've I've got another chart here. 
This goes into like 1647, 1634, and there's definitely a whole bunch of these. So um, in the 17th century. The vasectomy pre ether would have been interesting. Indeed. Oh, can you imagine that? We want to operate. Um, just kill me. Yeah, pl yeah. please. <laughs> You're going to anyway, and it's going to suck. Stone. Bring it on. Yeah. yeah. Can you get me slaughtered drunk and then smash my head in really quickly? Yeah. Uh, King's Evil. King's Evil? That's got to be venereal. <laughs> it does sound venereal. It does. So that's uh, something to do with, with your front hole or your back hole. Uh, okay. And 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 your diet. Anna Greta, you got anything? No, I don't know. No, no, but it made me think of that, those porphyrias. There's that porphyria that gives you blue urine that happened Ooh. to a particular king at some it point. Did. George the Third ought never have occurred. Yes. Madness thereof. Uh, Wasn't it related to a substance? Yep. Too much copper, copper in his more something. Hints, William. More hints, William. Okay. Uh, no, this is to do, this is a scrofula, uh, tuberculosis of the neck and lymph glands. Ooh. My God, scrofula is a good word. It sounds like Dr. Seuss. Like it doesn't sound like a disease. The scrofula sound like a people. Yeah, the scrofula the sounds Dr. like from that time. It doesn't sound like an actual definition. Uh, here's a new one. Rising of the Isn't lights. Rising of the lights. They're so poetic, these we people. We really, we need a bit more of this in modern medicine. We really do. We need to bring some of this back. Uh, and you know bring, what? Let's bring back the, the poetic description. Oh, let's look, bring back. See, there you go. Next time, next time when you may be diagnosing someone, Anna Greta, and you can yeah. diagnose someone with these conditions, um, mm -hmm. you could say, look, you have rising of the lights. So is it something to do with a fever or like a redding of the skin? Uh, something inflammatory? Uh, no. Um, or... Oh, I'm out. <laughs> this one has nothing to do with lights as well. I have no idea why it's called Rising of the Lights. Ah, oh, so uh, it's the heart attack. <laughs> it's it's a condition indicated um, anything that has a hoarse cough. Uh, so croup, asthma, pneumonia, emphysema. Were, they're Rising of the Lights. So there you go, Anna Greta. You can, you, there you next, go, Rising next time, of the Lights. Next time um, someone has, a, has some sort yep. of asthma, you can say, oh, I believe it's a little bit of the, Rising of the Lights. Do you know what will make that perfect, Anna Greta? You, you say it to the parents of children. Well, what yep. they've got right is a Rising of the Lights. Yep. Uh, so what you need to do is go home and turn all the lights off. Yep. Yep. Cold compresses. Yep. A yep. poultice of poultice. dog poo and yep. basil. Fabulous. <laughs> yeah. Good. Good for what ails you. Chin cough. <laughs> it's only for large people. <laughs> So chin cough has got to be, um, uh, what do you call it? A is it a variation cancer. on Ludwig's angina? Oh, I don't, I don't know. I don't know about angina. Ludwig's angina. <laughs> that's, a, that's a contemporarily used term. Uh, no, I believe it is not. Mm. Uh, it has it has both the a cough. cancer, that's what I've got. It has a common name now, which is whooping cough, uh, which Ooh. is, what do they call that? What's the technical name? Um, yeah, that's it. All right, here's another one. Here's another one, which is a strange one. Pertussis was also a, uh, a Roman uh, centurion. He does sound like that, doesn't he? Mm. Uh, this one, and and is listed on this um, other other diseases chart. You won't be able to read that, but I'm I'm at all. Uh, but thanks for showing it to us. I know, yeah, but yeah, it, it's got words on there. It's got words. Uh, it's teeth. Teeth. You died of teeth. You died of so teeth. Do dog bite. Teeth. Is that, is that in the technical? That's in your with the Cornish accent, isn't it? You died of teeth. <laughs> He died of teeth. <laughs> he was well, then he got teeth and he freaking died. Well, yeah. That, <laughs> he any, got the teeth. Any guesses? So that, that, that's got to be, you, you've got an infection in your molar and your face makes you die. Uh, yes, a version of that. So, <gasps> so I'll, give, I'll, I'll give you a right. point for this. Um, uh, it was uh, in this period, a lot of babies would die uh, during teething. Uh, they were not sure what Infection. was causing this, but typically sure. it's because what they're doing is is they're going on to solid foods, um, off breast milk, and there is a much greater chance of infection and mm. of um, catching various sorts of things from untreated water. Those but that's still the case. That's why I only consume breast milk today, because <laughs> I do not want to get an infection. No. Thank you. Thank you for that. That's that that's, was for you. Will. That's great. That's great. But yeah, so so they would list list teeth as the cause of death. I, I'm <laughs> I'm not sure if they're blaming the teeth here or it is the teething. All right, here's here's my favourite because I love this. Um, it's the purples. The purples, some kind of poisoning. Uh, to do with it affects the blood. 
poisoning affecting the blood, probably making you uh, wither from the extremities. Help like, me out here, Anna Grande, you act, you're, you're the right kind the of doctor purple. for this. The, I, no, no. The purples. Okay. Uh, stuff purple blotches on the skin. Uh, could uh, be caused by a variety of different things, potentially uh, scurvy or a circulation disorder. Um, could also mean the most severe stage of smallpox. So that would be he has the purples. Yeah. Uh, liver There's grown. Different things causing this. Yeah, indeed. Levito reticularis, yes. Liver okay. grown? Liver grown. Liver grown? Liver grown. So that would be, what you call it, emphysema of the liver. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> Uh, cirrhosis of the liver yes uh, yes yeah. yes uh yes. that's an old term old term there um the liver the liver has grown they've gone well there, there's, there's your problem is that half a point because you know i mentioned emphysema of the liver oh maybe yeah maybe and, you... and and you were drinking at the same time so you get extra points for that i know how to stay healthy <laughs> exactly this shit kills germs i tell you yeah, absolutely uh the, the trick is trying to get them to drink it but um ching carry on megrome or or megrim those are two very different words, me grime or meg rim. These it's, are different it's, vowels. It's, unser- it's, it's written in different ways. Um, uh, and needs an accent, I think. Yeah, perhaps, perhaps. I'm not sure which accent this comes from. Just pick one. Do Russian. Yep. Migrom. There you go. I have migrom. You're going to die. What is it? I don't know. Migrom. Got anything? Migrom. No. It's uh, a corruption, or not a corruption, it's a pre corruption, mm-hmm. potentially of migraine. Uh, so it's assumed that seemed too obvious. That was the first thing that sprung to my mind. Yeah. I thought, no, that's a trap. It's assumed that any sort of aneurysm or brain obvious. tumor, um, mm. maybe what, what is actually killing people here. Mm. Um, but they're using the word migraine to, to lump everyone in there. Okay. Head mold shot. Head mold shot. Head mold shot. I had one of those at a pub just before the close down. They said, how many head mold shots do you want? They were terrible. <laughs> Blue cheese, rum, and a little bit of cream. Not a good drink. No, don't do that. No, I'm done with that. Head mold shot, and it's lethal. Yes. So it's a fungal thing, probably in your the corners of your eyes and, and the back of the nose, right up in the back. <laughs> I, I, I was born to be a diagnostician. I'm like a physician. Sounds like it. No, you, yeah. should, you should come and come and help with the difficult dilemma, diagnostic dilemmas. H- happy to do so. Um, yeah. No problem. Yeah. I, I think, I think you really you're not allowed to just not allowed to just make stuff up, unfortunately. Oh, yeah, that, that, yeah, that's you're going to the art of medicine, aren't you? Um, any any guesses on head mold shot? Head mold shot. I, I had a guess. I'll give you a clue. Coffee. It happens to happens to uh, newborns. Got some infection they get from the uh, birth canal. Uh, no, no, could sound like that. Uh, but I didn't think so either. No, so uh, currently known as uh, craniosynostosis. Uh, so where the, the bony plates of the skull are um, fused. fused and they're, uh, yeah, so the brain, I'm not sure. Uh, yep. here's, here's what it is. It's, it's what they're saying, that they overlap or they overshot. Yep. And so yep. somehow somehow they get head mold oh, shot. Good God. Your head mold is wrong, I think is what they're saying. Oh, mold, not, not mold as in the fungus, mold as in the shaping of something. Who knows? Because it's, it's Elizabeth, Elizabethan spelling, so I couldn't tell the difference. Well, it's probably got some wacky looking S's and strange letters in the middle of it that don't mean anything. Uh, all right. Bloody flux. Oh, that's shitting itself like empty, right? Uh, like shitting out your organs. Blood and poo everywhere. Standard Saturday night. That's what I'm going to call it. <laughs> Dysentery. Dysentery. Yeah. Dysentery. There we go. Uh, Dys- and you could also die of planet. Planet. Well, that would be a weakening of the bones such that gravity affects you so much that your body disintegrates. <laughs> mm. That's my best guess. Hmm. Nope. I don't know what the planet might be. What would okay. the planet be? These were superstitious times. And this is just <laughs> when medical practitioners, they got nothing else. And so what they say is, look, it seems like your planets are out of alignment. The and planet's so, out of alignment. You, 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 yep. You, yep. <laughs> so they wrote that yep. down. Now so, is your time. I'm sorry. Yep. The time has come. It's a, yeah. Why'd you die? Because you were gonna? So yep. on, the, on that list, there's a whole bunch of other ones. There's, there's a bunch of other ones that I can understand. So they, they wrote down cramp. I don't know how you die of cramp, but also itch. 
uh, sciatica, lethargy, stopping. Do you want to die of itch? Die from sciatica. How do you die of sciatica? Uh, how do you die of itch? A very strong one. Well, we do know. We've on, done an we episode. Do, we do on know itchy. on this podcast how you die that. of itch. So. Hmm. Uh, not good, not good. Listen, so you scratch good. all the way through to your Pemphigus brain. You can dial, yeah. Pemphigoid, Pemphigus, I always get confused, but yep. Um, there's a few others, a few others yep. here. There's uh, stopping of the stomach, uh, headache, devoured by lice. Uh, you mm. could die of being a lunatic. You could die of death. Uh, suddenly. You really could That's die. That's what I'm going to die of. I'd like to die of death, please. Yeah. Yeah, um, I'm confident death will kill me. If anything's going to kill me, I think it will be death. Yes. You could yeah. die of frighted and of grief and oh, this, I died right. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and this is a nice one plague in the guts plague in the guts now there's one to look forward to yes absolutely how does this differ from the bloody flux i mean it doesn't necessarily be bloody it could I, be anything else i don't know it doesn't sound good though like of all the places to have the plague i'm choosing not the guts like no. i don't want it anywhere there was a couple i couldn't find out there was bleach and blasted and overjoy and horseshoe head. Uh, overjoy. 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 Potentially manic. I'm definitely in danger of that. I'm definitely in danger of that. I'm a very happy chap. Uh, I could die of overjoy. Look, maybe maybe it's it's someone who has some sort of a mania um, and and they, they're bipolar yeah, and, they, and they've gone off the deep end. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I'm still in danger. Yep, yep, I like that. That's better than dying of death. Yeah, and I don't know what horseshoe head is either. Um, unless horseshoe it's, head. Unless it's really pretty literally, like a, a horse has kicked you, you know, you're, cha you're changing a horseshoe and the horse has kicked you in the head. I mean, you would Or it's that thing, die. again, Anna Greta, you could help the, 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 the kids who are born, is it hydroencephalitic or something? The, yep. Where the, yeah. Their brain's brain. not developing properly. Yep. Yeah. And there's a whole bunch of goo in the middle or something. So they only get kind of like a shell around the inside of their skull. Is that right? Yep. Maybe it's something like that because with the x-rays of the time, they would have been able to tell that the brain was shaped Absolutely. like a horseshoe. Yep. So, so all of those cranial dystopias would have been, they had all sorts of, what was that, mold, the brain mold shot, head, head, head mold, mold shot, shot? Head mold shot. Yep, wow. Don't, yep. don't, don't, don't you say it. cranial dystopias? Isn't that, actually, I think that is a new word. But That's it's wonderful. It, it's got it's got merit, <laughs> yep. It really does. I, I would watch all three of those movies, Cranial Dystopia 1, Cranial 2. Cranial Dystopia. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it might, might be the catchphrase for the moment, actually. Mm. Yeah, probably. Yep. Uh, if I you like want, that. check out, um, there's a great website called Old Disease Names by um, Sylvain Chazalet. Uh, now you tell me, I should have been looking at that at the I, time. I, I know, I know. And, the, and, and I just love the names. Like, the names are just so great. There's... You were asking me what I was doing on my leave because people at home, I just started taking a bit of a holiday, whatever that means nowadays. I now know I'm going to be looking at that website for yeah. seven days straight. Just chuckling. That's it. That's it. John Grant. John Grant was born in 1620 in London. He was the eldest of seven or eight children. This may seven be this, well. This is this may be the reason he took up his his particular. Um, you can imagine the parents. Like, how many bedrooms do we need? Nah, seven or eight. <laughs> seven or eight. Well, <laughs> work it out. Yeah. Uh, well, maybe Between it's not a good day. Between fourteen and sixteen pairs of shoes would be great. He grew up to work as a haberdasherer in his father's shop. Now, at what, what some point in his haberdashery career, he became uh, interested on the side in what we would now call epidemiology. Uh, so he took the bills of morality charts and started to look at them. He thought, you know, I'm an accountant. I'm an accountant in my haberdashery. I love counting reams of haberdash, uh, yeah. counting what people owe me, all of those kinds of things. Being an accountant is a key mm. part of my job. We could probably apply a little bit of accountancy principles to this data. And what he did um, was basically grandfathering both the sciences of demography and epidemiology. So what he did, he took the numbers that were printed in all of the bills of morality and thought, I can actually see what people are dying of here. So through, he looked at 20 years of those bills, so once a week, looking over 20 years, and he found a list of 81 causes of death, which he started what, to... What year were we talking, sorry? Uh, he was born in 1620, so he's doing this okay. in, the, I think it's the 1650s. A uh, bloody long time ago, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so mm. this is, this is um, early on. Um, mm. So first of all, he categorised them in these 81 causes of death into a couple of categories, chronic diseases, epidemic yeah. diseases, conditions that killed children, which... Yeah, probably could have covered some of those. And outward griefs, uh, which he meant injuries, you know, like uh, right. ho ho potentially horseshoe head might be an but We're, an we're still back grief. to that poetry, like outward griefs. To say injury. I, know. I mean, it's beautiful. 
obviously it makes my heart sing, but I don't know what he's talking about. They were a poetic time. They all wanted to they, be a little, little bit Shakespearean in their world. And never use one word where you can use 20. Well, here you go. Here's, here's his title. He published his ideas <laughs> in Natural and Political Observations Made Upon the Bills of Morality, which, okay, it's not the longest title from that year. No, that's quite a short one. Um, but uh, it was a high-impact book. So straight away... It showed a bunch of things that people had never really known before. Some of them, okay, yeah, they had a pretty good hint on, but he's starting to put data here that was revolutionary at the time. Mm. Uh, First of all, showed a very high rate of mortality in infancy. Uh, I think they probably knew that, but anyway. Uh, Mortality was higher in London than in the country, which uh, they didn't know. They didn't know anything about that before. Uh, He made the first realistic estimates of the numbers of men and women in London and the population of the whole country to show that they were both actually increasing with a steady migration to London, which was actually a weird thing at the time. Uh, no so one, ignoring even diseases, he mm. kind of did the first census. It, it, absolutely. Well, well, it's not the first census because there's, there's definitely pre-censuses before. On the Doomsday Book and all that shit. Yeah. But, yeah, but, that, but um, it's still interesting to have come up with that fact. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And to okay. show that populations are increasing was actually mm. weird because uh, previously people had always thought populations are either static or we're all going to doom because, you know, there was the, the good biblical times and since then we've gotten a lot worse. Uh, it's all been shit since Eden. That's what I've always said. He also, and we'll come back to this a little bit later, uh, demonstrated that plague was underreported by about a quarter. So he's, he's... Luckily, that doesn't happen anymore. Uh, in, in, <laughs> I was going to say, like coronavirus. In oh, bloody we got that sorted. I know, I know. Well, look, that, that might be a little bit of a theme of what I want to talk to you. I'm um, not saying it. So uh, this, was, this was high impact at the time. Um, mm-hmm. He also showed a few things on, on suicides being consistent and under-recording of syphilis and an increase in rickets. I don't know why. Uh, the book, the book, Exposure to sunlight. Everyone knows that we're still doing it. Academic processes were much faster back then. As soon as the book was published, one month later, um, he uh, a second edition appeared um, in uh, later down the track. But one month after publishing the first, he was invited to become a fellow of the Royal Society, the first tradesperson, I believe, to become a, a member of the Royal Society. I really wish we could tweak our academic processes to do do that right but now. Because... Like, one month later, like uh, <laughs> surely, surely there are a lot more forms to fill out these days than that. One or two. <laughs> there are also a couple more academics. Uh, in, it, sure, sure. Like um, six to seven percent more. In fact, soon afterwards, I believe I believe the king said, um, it would be good if you found some more of these tradespeople to join your society. <laughs> <laughs> this uh, is Scott Morrison. <laughs> <laughs> the only way forward <laughs> is plumbing. And by plumbing, I, I mean I think hanging what, two bits of wood together for your country. I think what he meant was not tradies in the sense of we, our beloved tradies are the greatest people in the universe, but instead I think he meant the lower classes is what he was he was talking about. That's what I meant too. Uh, indeed, is indeed. Is which is, which is, which is a, a good thing for the king to recommend in the time. Uh, so uh, Grant's work is still used today to study uh, population trends and mortality. For example, studies on suicide uh, will still look at his reporting as the sort of earliest base level that there existed. Uh, he was, he was cool. also the first person to, um, to build, although there's some flaws in it, but he was the first person to do it, a life table predicting basically uh, life expectancy. Oh, so, dailies and shit, daily adjusted uh, life. Not, not quite as far as that, yeah, but yeah. Um, he's predicting from birth uh, yeah. What percentage of people will be left at the age of six, at the age of sixteen, and, and or based on 26. Their, like where they live, how they live, la la la, all that sort of crap. Yeah, based on the bills of uh, mortality. So they That's didn't impressive. actually typically record um, the age people were at the the death. But but the first thing he used was he looked at things like teething, and there was another disease called chrysomes, which was not a disease. It was anything that people died around christening. Um, so you died around then, oh, you got the the chrysomes. Uh, but he looked at those kinds of things and used that to then say, okay, probably about 36% of births uh, of um, uh, children born uh, will be deceased by the age of six. And then he could, then he charted that. Third. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Wow. Well, a lot of those, a lot of those in childbirth um, and certainly, certainly in early childhood, but a mm. lot in that early phase. So, wow, that's amazing stuff. That's really, yep. Yeah, I, like, and it's, and it's, what we do today. it's yeah. revolutionary. I think I think the, the big thing mm. is here, someone who's gone, hang on, there's a big pile of data there. And mm. and yes, you've used it to say where people are dying of the plague and then you're using it for other diseases. But then to go, mm. 
actually, if you start looking at this, you stack the weeks on top of each other, we can look at all these trends and it's such a shift towards, you know, an abstracted scientific um, epidemiological mm. way of look, thinking. It's, it's amazing, really. Data-driven data science, data-driven decision-making, all sorts of crazy stuff. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you're nudging into policy. I know. Like we'll that all be goes screwed. back to science. No. Just, yep, avoid that. So the next important question took a little while to be asked, but it was uh, if we can understand what people die of, um, can lifetime be prolonged by a knowledge of the causes that cut it short? Absolutely no way. No, impossible. That's insanity. <laughs> That's pretty much alchemy. I won't have it. Well, it took actually quite a long time. So Grant was working in the, um, the middle of the 17th century. Uh, mm. William Farr was working in the middle of the 19th century. So basically 200 years later. So while Grant did, did a fair... <laughs> it's a slow realisation. Hang on. <laughs> Hang on. We can do more with that. <laughs> it just struck me. <laughs> well, it's weird. I mean, the, to be, he was... Uh, Grant was an accountant of, of diseases. And he, and he liked counting that. And, and, and yeah. clearly he had innovations here. But it's a strange thing. I mean, we're so used to the idea of saying, okay, what's your impact statement? What do we, what do, we do with this? What's your recommendations? What's the, <laughs> so a lot of people are dying in childbirth. Uh, and he was like, yes. Yes. We just accept that. They are. Does this, would this help you, Anna Greta, if we adopted any of this now or that just too advanced? Uh, well, look, uh, yeah, it sounds very complicated, doesn't it, really? Mm. Not the sort of stuff we use very often for very much. Um, can't think of easily the examples. No. Um, uh, um, oh, I, I guess that sometimes it seems to influence things like funding oh, um, right. for research, mm. for example. Yeah, it does ring prioritizes, a bell. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I have heard it used. Um, uh, there are examples, I think, in the literature where it's used to, let's say, guide social interventions or guide government interventions and decision-making. Yep, interesting stuff. Wow. We should give it a crack. We should push it harder. We could, yeah. Yep. With we all could. our power. <laughs> William Farr wanted to. So William Farr uh, was working in the middle of the 19th century. Uh, in 1836, when he was 28, he, uh, they decided to replace the bills of mortality with mm. what would become the beginnings of a death registration system. So something that looks the like... The other one was much prettier. Uh, this is a modern... Well, this is not modern. This is uh, actually one from the 20th century. Death certificate. So... Is that yours? Because like the guy at the beginning, he was oh, dead and alive. Is that your death certificate? That is not mine. That is I, I, That would be cool if I could show my death certificate. Cool's, cool Cool's doing a lot of work there. Well, no, because mine is obviously going to say died in the year 3000 of partying too hard. Of cool and as fuckness. Indeed. <laughs> like, yeah. like, obviously. <laughs> ancientness. Yeah, I've died of ancientness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something like that. Excessive ancientness <laughs> at that point in time. Yep. Um, and so they, he became the first compiler of abstracts, which is looking after these death certificates. Hmm. Um, so his goal, his goal was not just to keep the books, but he wanted to use these statistics to try and save lives. And so okay. this is the point when they really started to shift into an epidemiological sort of idea of how can we use data to actually answer public health questions. So the first thing they needed to do, um, and this would have been a party of a meeting, was the at the International Statistical Congress of 1853, which is the first... Oh, no, let me let, me let that wash These are the ones we all want to go to, aren't the they? The first no, International no. Statistical yep. Congress. Yep. As uh, a five-year-old, I would dream about the day that I could somehow be eligible to go to such a meeting. I'm sure there still, are. Still, still no Nine-year-olds just think about the Statistical con Congress of the future. Yep. Uh, Look, and can you imagine being there at the first one? You get to uh, you get to shape T-tests into the future. You get to decide I didn't know it was going to be dirty talk. I didn't know. I didn't know. I'm getting all flushed. Uh, but the first job they had was to make a, a standard chart. You can't use um, these terrible terms anymore. You can't just no. say teething or, or chrysomes or uh, what was it? A horseshoe head. Uh, instead, oh, we, yeah. we've got to try and oh, get uh, yep. standardised these things. So mm. the first thing, um, there were some still things. They did keep teething on there for a little while, actually. Uh, but teeth. They, they teeth. Got, uh, yeah, well, teeth. Not I mean. even teething, just teeth. What did he die of? Teeth. Well, they, they kept got it bitten. on. Nope. But they got rid of things like blasted and itch, which I still, you know, I don't know what they were. I've seen people come close to being dead from blasted. I used to work in a very rough bar. I'm sure. I'm sure. In fact, one guy did die of blasted. His brother came running in. He was a hillbilly. He had no teeth. And he ran in after many hours and said, have you seen my brother? 
And I looked at him and I'd never seen him before. He's like, I know exactly who his brother must be. <laughs> of course. No, I haven't. And then the manager came running in about an hour later and went, he's fucking dead. Oh. And this guy had drunk so heavily and obviously oh. been that unwell that he just keeled over and died. Jesus. So you can die of blasted. I've almost Jesus. seen it happen. And and hence why we have a responsible service of alcohol uh, clause. We didn't have that when I worked behind bars. That was not <laughs> yeah. a thing. Look, I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure went. back in the 20th century. Not where things... I was drinking either. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah, I did. I, and look, when I was a bouncer, we weren't obliged to be licensed either. We were just supposed to be, you know, kick ass. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Will, that's oh, not related shit, to the story. Shit except was worse you said blasted. Than... No, I get it. I get it. Uh, so they wanted to. But that ICD coding still causes mm. pain today. Uh, that that and and one might argue that the framing may not be complete. Well, here's uh, the thing, Anna Greta. Well, for those listening at home, international classification of diseases put out by the World Health Organization is what ICD is. I think. Yes, it is. So yeah. this this became. But, but it did start in this Congress that we all missed. So years ago. they started yep. calling it the. It was a classification of diseases you could die from. But then mm. uh, in the 20th century. Century, they said, "Hang on, we want to look at all diseases." Uh, yep. Yeah. Over time, it has grown until now. It is the the ICD-10, the International Classification of Diseases-10, and it still uses the same structure from yeah. 1853. Uh, it's yep. been ICD-10 for like two decades too. Like they've really got to. Where's eleven? Update. We need a sequel. We need a sequel. Where's eleven? Yeah, it, but isn't it interesting that it's framed in the same way that was mm. put forward at that meeting that we missed two hundred years ago? Uh. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. some things don't change. You know, some things, you know, you can d die of accidents and versus yep. die of, of a disease. You know, I think that's a pretty clear classification that will probably stay for some time. Uh, it's a boring book, though. What, what was it? Disease or accident? Yeah, sure. Well, there We're is done. there is some critique. I mean, not critique, but uh, this is not driven by one stakeholder. So mm. following the, you know, the Second World War and the WHO um, uh, was born and took over this, there, there were a whole bunch of other stakeholders that got involved in it. So insurance companies are like, oh, we want to use this for hospital billing purposes. Um, and so public health <laughs> yes, people are like, did. they're pulling in different sorts of directions. Uh, so th there are multiple people that use this giant list. So there's probably Ins not going to be Insurance companies have been the driving force for many, many, many things people don't think about. Not, not always negative, but... Let's just say. So, create. Anna Greta, you might well. I, I, if it's if there's a more recent one than this, but the ICD-10 supposedly is like twenty two hundred pages long. Uh, yeah. The first cause of death, a zero zero point zero. Do you use those bits? Cholera due to Vibrio cholera O one. Cholera. Uh, and the last one is Y eighty nine point nine sequelae of unspecified external cause. So. Uh, <laughs> that's, so that's the. What, can you classify it? Yeah, something fucking killed him. So that's pretty much it. <laughs> sure. Well, you need you need an, a misc other. Like this is the the ARC uh, category for science communication. It's other 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 other. Yeah. <laughs> misc communication other. definitely. Yeah, other yeah, this this classification stuff is really important. This is what funds our hospital system. It's what mm. funds our, our medical industry. Mm. Um, this is what there's there's a whole there are a whole there are rooms often basements of people who go through medical records coding it according to that extraordinary document. That's um, the only way you'll get health insurance. Framework. If you're not it, diagnosed, it, it, you don't get your health insurance payments. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Perfect I, system. I did you, like you need, this writing. You need a label. Everybody needs a label. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, we do. So this is this there's there's writing now that um, someone said okay there's eight thousand officially sanctioned ways to die. Uh, and in most parts, most parts. Can I can I go for the eight thousand and one, and therefore I'm not allowed to die? Well, this is what it said. It's it's illegal to die of old age now. I'm not going to do it then. <laughs> I like the framing of that. Feck them. Yeah. It's... So you can't put that on the death certificate. You can't say died of old age. This is in fact, the most likely thing you're going to write on a death certificate is drum roll. Natural cardiologist. No, you can't put that on a death certificate either. What really? can you put? What's the most what likely? It's the most uh, common thing to write heart on disease. a death certificate. Heart disease. Heart, heart, heart failure. Disease. So what does it mean? It means in practice that you've written on the death certificate asystole, cardiac arrest, oh, myocardial infarction, your heart stops. So you're, you're going to find something in that ICD code book that's under cardiovascular and yeah. you're, going to, you're going to use a phrase that is easily amenable to one of those codes. 
this is what I love. This is what I love. Like you, you build this whole categorization system and I read some yeah. data on this and I'm sure Anna Greta, you're going to back this up, but it's <laughs> no fuzzy, it, how accurate but it is. it's yeah. fuzzy and people, you know, there's, there's data saying, you know, there's, there's a little box. Um, I've got the, you know, in, this is the American one from 1930. There's four lines. This is, mm. this is a great, uh, a fascinating historical document um, from 1980 in the Northern Territory where, words. where someone um, was killed, taken by a dingo. Uh, but it's someone. 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 Could be anybody. <laughs> someone, someone. Uh, but a lot of the research, a lot of the research is saying that it's really hard, that it's really so hard for doctors in your so, position. So what, what's written on that death certificate? From um, We couldn't see somehow. We no, couldn't it's too quite quick. see. What, what's the cause of death on that death certificate? Cause of death. Inquest held 12th June 2012, Elizabeth Norris, uh, Morris North, NT Coroner. The cause of her death was as a result of being attacked and taken by a dingo. The other one, the the other one in America, is crushed chest and abdomen, uh, mimothorax and mimoperitoneum in aeroplane crash. It was a famous part. Uh, yeah, he got squashed by a plane that he was flying. But the bottom line, according to Anagreta, anyway, it boils down to died by death is actually not an unreasonable thing to put then, because that's what you're saying. We just say heart. Yeah, no, no. So, so yeah. um, I'm, I don't know how eaten by a dingo fits into the ICD code. I think well, you know the heart would eventually stop. So. Yeah, no, no. So absolutely. What you put on there is myocardial infarction or yeah. a cardiac arrest. Yeah. Um, How did it happen? Dingo ate That's it. actually what happens when you bleed out from your death. So are you dingo. saying that's illegal? Yeah. Like that they didn't use one of the ICD classifications? There's no dingo in ICD? I think it's an, you know, what, what was the actual cause of death? I and, get... uh, and uh, you know, this, this comes back. Uh, everything we're looking at here is about the biology of disease. Yeah. Um, we don't have in there the poverty that causes disease or that increases the likelihood of dying. We don't have in there the geography that influences our life expectancy. So what we I'm, don't have in there the environmental determinants. So until. what? What I mean, how how much do you write in in Australian terms? Do you do you write just what killed them right there, or do you talk about the proximate or the the things that are surrounding to say you know? Uh, so I think that, I think you know having having filled out the old one and and so it's important to reflect on the accuracy of these um, death certificates. Mm. There's no doubt everybody takes them seriously when we're doing them, yep. but um, it's given to sometimes to the member of the team who may or may not have known what was going on with the patient. It might be that we're filling out a death certificate in hospital for someone who's been unwell for a long time but only been with us for a day or two. Mm. Um, and so how much of that narrative, that broader thing that it contributes to the end of someone's life, how much of that is reflected in the paperwork, I think, varies, varies tremendously. Yeah. And did, did you find numbers to the accuracy? Uh, I think the accuracy and how do you, you get an accuracy of death certificates by looking at autopsy versus death certification? Yeah. So I've got some numbers not on, on the actual accuracy, but on what uh, doctors felt about them. Um, Can I so, clarify yeah. the actual accuracy? Well, That's in, like well, alternative facts, right? No, no. What I mean is, if you were to go and do the perfect autopsy on each person, and then yeah. and then have have I don't know a team of um, all a dozen uh, doctors to work out what the actual cause is versus what the um, the resident or the rush doctor yeah. wrote at that time, uh, even then, you know, what do we know? But so, how, how many deaths end up you, in an autopsy anyway? Oh, like, if very you want to verify, few, yeah, no, very few, and an increasingly yeah. small number. Yeah. Yeah. And and you know, it's hard to argue with putting down the heart stopped in a technical way because it did. Um, is is it almost always? It is. It's ultimately the. Well, not almost death. always. I think every time. It is. No, it absolutely is. I mean, I'm a cardiologist, so I'm tremendously biased towards this, but. <laughs> Um, but it's, it's, it's really it's hard to argue with important. the fact that it's ultimately it's when your heart stops is when you vested die. interest. So a neurologist yep. would say brain death, oh, fucking absolutely. cardiologist with all your my heart matters. But the, da the data matters because we get more money. Mm. We get lots of money yeah. because one in four Australians die from heart disease, according to the death certificates. Oh, yep. I'm feeling a little cynical about these now, William. So, well, here's, here's some numbers. Uh, this is from 2010 in uh, New York. Uh, they surveyed 500 doctors. Um, only a third believed death certificates to be accurate. Nearly half reported knowingly listing an inaccurate cause of death. And that number rose to almost 60% um, amongst those with the most experience. So, so the most honest. So, well, look, um, this, this does mean, okay, of clearly what we're saying here is uh, there's, there's not, not necessarily faked for fraudulent reasons or anything like that, mm -hmm. although we'll come to that a little bit later, but that it's, it's kind of tricky. It's kind of tricky to say, what did, what did people die of? And look, yep. 
here's here's one that I do wonder about. So, in in the in New York in the nineteen thirties, there was uh, there was a growth in what were called vanity death certificates. Uh, the state would issue a public death certificate um, because in America, death certificates are a public record. What um, died of sexiness and fame. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Oh. Why'd you die? Good look on. I'm so good looking. Uh, and then they would do a, a second private one. Uh, and yeah. typically... Ball cancer. Typically, yes, it would yeah. be, it would be yeah. hiding uh, more embarrassing diseases, syphilis or something like that, or uh, potentially in different areas, suicide or something like that, which is, as you know, yeah. we sort of flagged earlier, Huge echo here in uh, the number of people dying of pneumonia in Florida in the last uh, last few months. A statistically significant uptick in deaths from pneumonia just when COVID's washing through. It's a coincidence, always is. Indeed. So, it's and and here's the thing: it's not like it wasn't pneumonia. It's not like it didn't show all of the symptomatology of pneumonia and it's echo pneumonia. all of that pathways. So, yeah. You know, so you can write that. But so back to the 80s, they didn't die of AIDS, sorry, HIV or whatever. They died of a, a, another pathogen or they died of heart failure or whatever it may be. Yep. So it's almost, yep. almost like, like it's politically motivated. Well, it's, it's almost just, like oh, first the, 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 the form is hard to fill out and it, it's, it's actually tough. <laughs> it, it's actually, you know, forms are hard to fill out in, well, at I the know. best of times. And then when you've got a little box to say what that, what caused that death, then, yeah. uh, then what do you do? So, Yeah. Yeah, What's no, a person think... who deals in breathing called? Pulmonologist. Okay, pulmonologist. Surely... But pulmonologist is a much better word. Yeah. Surely they win. Why did they die? No, no more breathing. So respiratory failure. Yeah, that's probably the second most common, really. Yeah, okay. Cardiac yeah. failure. Yep. So there's a there's a study from uh, 1990. Um, William Fogan, yeah. Michael McGuinness uh, showed that nearly half of all deaths in the United States in 1990 could be attributed to nine factors that were not listed on death certificates. So these are things like tobacco. I mean, these are things we all know. Tobacco, diet and physical activity, alcohol, microbial agents, toxic agents, firearms. Uh, I was going to ask about guns. But here's the thing. Oh, yeah, the the other ones are sexual behavior, motor vehicles, and illicit use of drugs. These are all the the things that we know that uh, can can, can contribute directly. Yeah, okay. Uh, but contribute directly to a lot of people dying, but they're not listed on death certificates. And so, you know, should we be shifting what we write on death certificates? And so here's one mm. of the things that I want to uh, look at is should we look at the at climate change on death certificates? So this is, <laughs> this is from a paper that Anna Greta sent me um, the other day. Uh, national mortality records in Australia suggest substantial underreporting of heat-related mortality. So less than 0.1% of the 1.7 million deaths between 2006 and 2017 were attributed directly or indirectly to excessive natural heat. However, less than what percentage? Uh, less than 0.1%. Po- However, less than 0.1%. But here's, here's the big one. Recent research indicates that official records underestimate that association at least 50 times. Hmm. So, so sh- the, the, the literal numbers were a couple of hundred over that 10 or 11 year period that, that we looked at. Um, nationally. Very, nationally. Uh, Across Australia, so 1.7 million people died, roughly speaking. There about there were a couple of there were a hundred and something that were ad- directly attributable to heat, and there yeah. were some that were associated with heat. So with a death certificate, you've got a primary cause, and then you've got some secondary factors. You've got you've got license, I think, for some narrative into your death certificates, hmm. um, but it was literally in the hundreds. And so that period of time, um, that that eleven year period, included uh, events like Black Saturday in Melbourne. And so that Black Saturday mm. fire, uh, there were one hundred and seventy nine people killed, I think, by the fire. Um, and the analysis done by the Victorian government at that time showed about three hundred and seventy people died as a result of heat. Um, so there was this, ex- and so so we know. I mean, that's that's one event over a few months in one state. Yeah. It's a, it's a massive underreporting of the environmental determinants of health. Yeah. But realistically, though, we we got to think about this. I mean, the uh, the spouse of our director what? is a, is a philosopher who specialises in cause and effect or causality. He is, and and this intrigues me because the idea about what actually caused you to die, mm. and I mean, as we've been joking, your heart stopped. True. That ultimately meant you died. What caused your heart to stop? What caused the thing that caused your heart to stop? I mean, where do you begin? Like, will you say saying climate change, poverty, there's uh, a, you know, malnutrition? There's a Mark Twain story from Huckleberry Finn, or, or, I think. And Huckleberry's talking to talking to a girl, 
and and I don't know how it gets to it, but she says, you know, well, if you stub your toe and then you sit down on a well and you fall into the well and you break your neck, uh, did you die of the stubbed toe? Or did yeah. I falling down? And now, yeah, that's that's. that's this is not dissimilar. I mean, ultimately, I'm, not, I'm I'm I know it sounds like it's a bit shitty and esoteric, but the reality is, where, where do you where do you draw the line? You could say everyone dies because their heart stops, or they stop breathing, or they got old. I mean, there are a couple of clear causes that make you stop being alive. But what caused them, and what caused them, and what caused them? Blah 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 blah. blah. That 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 to so me. That, means I mean, that's absolutely the crux of it. Do you do you just want the biological information? Do you want yeah. to have the disease? You know, do you want coronavirus? Do you want staph aureus? Do you want heart disease? Do you want hmm. lung disease? Or do you want to get a richer data set about the things that determine the health and well-being of your population? And hmm. um, if you look at things like the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare and the way in which they look at our uh, Australian health data, they, they add in layers of complexity. They've got some social and economic data that goes on top of population mortality. Um, and I think that that helps us to inform where and how we can improve well-being and life expectancy. Um, and the bit that's missing, so, so if we go back to this original framing of how we might look at disease, um, the original framing, which is an extraordinary leap, isn't it, from just thinking that people mm. die and it's part of a natural process, thinking we might be able to measure it and that then using that to inform policy in a meaningful way. Um, the environmental determinants of health are absent. They're, they're woefully underestimated, they're underrepresented. Um, and I'm not putting climate change on a death certificate, but I, I think that the people who died uh, over this period of the last six months who've had exposure to the bushfire smoke, yeah, yeah. Um, there will good, be a good proportion of deaths in this region and southwestern, uh, southeastern New South Wales and around the coast. Um, the, the, the deaths that were, were potentially avoidable if we hadn't been exposed to an absolutely horrendous summer. What would so happen to you if you actually it, wrote climate change? If you just if you literally looked at it and went, you know what killed them? No, so if you put the climate change down as, as the cause of death, then that's going to be questioned and you're going to be asked to do it again. Um, so it doesn't fit into an ICD code, does it? Go, go home. But, but you can put it. down, you could put bushfire smoke exposure in, in the list of you know, other primary or secondary causes right. for death. Um, yeah. So you get this, this nice little narrative, the, the thing that killed you now and then the stuff that happened in the days, weeks, months or years beforehand mm. and then any significant comorbidities that go with that or associated factors. But if we don't start room, documenting... There's room within the structure of the death certificate that you can provide that sort yeah. of information. But if we don't document it, then we're never going to be able to count it. We're if, never going to be able to... If we don't look for it, we yeah. don't know that it's there so yeah. like in the same way that we're talking about infant mortality and the difference between uh, life expectancy in cities and countries we, we we know that in australia because we look for it explicitly what we what we don't look for explicitly is this relationship with things like temperature yeah. with extreme weather events with things like air pollution um, and we, we know a little bit about it we don't know enough about it if we see it in our data we might learn all sorts of really interesting things about ourselves and about the fact that human health and planetary health are connected so now we're back to arguing about what's the point of collecting the data like what's it yeah. for yeah so if it's just to tick a box an insurance box or a, okay they're dead now let's enact the will yep. then yes they died heart stop done let's get on with it now you get ten thousand bucks you get which, which will always money. remain part of this like like of course it will. a death yeah, certificate yeah, yeah. clearly has multiple users like yeah you need it to turn off netflix and to stop your mortgage or whatever i will never turn off netflix i want mine to be eternal <laughs> in in the, in the coffin fair enough but you yep. also but it is also clearly uh, a public health document a public health document <laughs> used by insurance companies and used by governance and researchers to be able to say but that's Should what I mean. So there are this? multiple stakeholders, I hate the word, but anyway, who, who have, they have a, a vested interest in what the, what the purpose of the information is, yep. which is always going to make it difficult because they're not necessarily wrong. They're just different, which must be, I mean, luckily I don't have to sign off on these, but one of the three of us here does. That can't be easy. <laughs> that's what we have minions. No, sorry. <laughs> that's what we I have interns minions. and residents and registrars and, and layers of bureaucracy within hospitals. Yeah. But welcome to your uh, experience. No, I, mean, I, I, I do still do them occasionally. That, yeah. The other thing, look, the thing that they provide, they provide obviously that that um, logistical thing of being able to turn off uh, and uh, the, the procedural side of it. Mm. But for, for families, that often makes a big difference. They look back, you know, mm. they go through this trauma of losing a loved one. 
um, some of the information at the time is a little hard to digest and they go back there people find themselves months or years down the track looking at this document thinking oh well, what do you mean they had kidney failure we never discussed that um, so it's quite interesting that that, that human experience and I, and I think that there's a narrative component to this and that's what you get by looking at the history of this is that it's an extraordinary way to look at how human relationships were running yeah. and we still do that even with our biological framing where we're absolutely mm. reflecting that so it's for families, it's for statistical purposes, and it, it informs our policy choices moving forward. And that's where the, the, uh, the, in, the importance of putting the environmental stuff there um, mm. is in, in the policy framing. Yep. Mm. So when you raise that, do, do people respond saying, yeah, we should do that? Or are people like, oh, it's a form, it's really hard to change a form, you need the new form form or the form update form? Before you can before you can so, change it. I mean, well, they say speaking, fuck off, hippie. They like, say, as if you can no, say no, no, they, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I, I had some really interesting uh, interviews around this uh, when we put that, um, that that paper out from the Lancet a few months ago, um, and you know, people asking, would you put climate change on a death certificate? We're not going to put ever going to put that down as a first cause of death. Um, but I think that acknowledgement argument for things like bushfire experiences resonates with people in yeah. a real way. Mm. Um, and so, uh, no, never again. Bushfires, heat, dehydration, all sorts of elements that can easily be within the current framework added in. But the broader discussion is that for health, for our health um, policymakers and for our health data people, and there's a whole heap of people for whom that that conference, that statistical conference, remains really, really interesting. And we should all pay attention to that because it governs where, how much is the MRFF funding? How much money each year goes to medical research funding in Australia? Big bag of loot. Uh, yeah, it's it's only it's only five to six hundred and fifty million dollars a year. Only, yeah. Only, yeah. So that's that's Australian taxpayers' money, and that all goes to various forms of research. And uh, it, that research a direction uh, is often guided by the data. So cardiovascular disease does well out of this. Um, it causes it's a cause of death for twenty five percent of Australians. Yeah, that's so well, I think you should get into cause of death was death. You should get into death research. I should get into death research. Yeah. Well, maybe that's what we're doing. <laughs> yeah. So, so maybe if we if we chuck in there that climate change might contribute to you know five percent or ten percent of Australia's mortality in the last decade through temperature, through extreme weather events, through bushfire smoke. If we throw that into the mix. And some of our health resources might head in that direction. And that's no, a conservative point. governments that will shut matters. that shit down in five seconds. No, I, yep. but but no, I, I look. I yep. think it's really important if you if we're even at the prosaic level of saying bushfire smoke. You know, that's it's a climate association. But just looking at bushfire smoke, it would be yep. really important to understand what fraction of people are being affected, and is this changing and getting worse over the years? So if you don't count it, then it doesn't count. Yep. yep. It's true. If you don't count, it doesn't exist. If you want to know what you want to control for it, you got to measure it. We're back to that science stuff again, aren't oh, we? No, right. oh, no, so right. no, 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 it's getting in the way again. You're right, it's getting in the way. Oh, no, getting no. in the way. Back off. Back that to emotions. Quick, quick. There are three general categories where people may be falsely declared dead by mistake, <laughs> as a punishment for a crime, or by fraud. So mistaken. Sometimes people who are declared dead return. And, punish you dead. Yeah, well, no, they're, they're, I'll, I'll get to punish being dead in a second, and it's not execution. So one study estimated that every year, uh, US Social Security Administration declares 12,000 alive citizens as dead. Uh, this is in the US. Uh, so, for example, Donald E. Miller Jr., an Ohio man, was declared legally dead in 1994. Mm. He resurfaced in 2013 and sued to be declared alive, but the court declined and ruled he was still legally dead because Ohio state law did not allow reversing legal declarations of death if more than three years had passed. So I, I believe they weren't disputing that it was him. They're just saying, you took too long, mate. Who in the hell Who in the hell says, we've got this idea for a law? After three years, if they come back and they're actually alive, no, fuck it. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> What 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 kind of fine legal mind <laughs> makes that argument? No, mate, four four years ago, I, I I don't know. What's wrong with your brain when you say? Yeah, that sounds fair enough to me. I have a law degree from I don't know online. Let's university. put this in there. It should be two years and eleven months and yeah. thirty days. Yeah. If they turn up after that, they don't exist. It was a like compromise a somewhere. Oh, look, you can, you, I guarantee some people will say, "No, nah, there's no statute of limitations. It's it's got to be zero. As soon as it's done, they can't undo it." I don't know. But, but they're not dead. This is an anti <laughs> python sketch. You're going back to the biology again. Okay, <laughs> silly man. Okay, here's yeah. a new one. Here's well, a different one. Punitive. So uh, 
certainly throughout the Middle Ages, up until the 20th century in the US, um, and some people argue now still, uh, mm. governments around the world practice what is known as civil death. So in this uh, in this scenario, a person loses all rights uh, normally granted to a living person. Right. Um, so in, in basically they are declared dead before the law. And so what it means, it is legal to murder that person because that person does not exist anymore. Wow. This is yeah. a great Black Mirror episode. Oh, totally. You can imagine. Well, people are saying this is coming back in the sense of people losing rights after they've been incarcerated. So as you yeah. lose more and more rights, yeah, yeah. you are you are experiencing a graduated form of civil death. But this but, actually is a Black Mirror episode where you're, you're because everyone has a, I don't know, some kind of fancy contact lens that, that can be controlled. If you are being deemed to be non-existent, people literally can't see and hear you. Yep. This is like a warm-up yep. version of that. Oh, I, I, and I'm sure culturally it's been Shocking. around for a long time. But, but yeah. the, the thing is where, where those sort of cultures mesh with bureaucracies that go, no, you're dead, you're dead. Oh, God, and so I, and, just, and just such a barbaric thing to do that mm. bu- bureaucracies, for all of their modernity, can still be barbaric enough to say, no, we wipe you off, you know. Yep. We don't care about you anymore. You are dead to us. Oh, I think that's so gross. Yep. So gross. Oh, it's just ugh, blood run. Yeah, no, that's yeah. a, yep. So the last, the last, very category. cruel and unusual, uh, yeah. absolutely cruel. I, I, and unusual. I'd like to yeah. buy this thing and use a credit card. I'm sorry, so you don't exist. Yeah, yeah, you, and you cannot exist anymore. Like you can't get onto our forms. Can I fight you it? No, you can't, because no. how could someone no, who doesn't can't. exist fight? You can't go to court. You don't exist. Well, yeah. how could someone ex- that doesn't exist fight? Well, we'll come here. We go. So the last, okay. the last version is the, yeah. the fraudulent cases. So in mm. two directions, obviously faking one's own death. Or having one's death faked for one by a dastardly uncle or uh, a spouse who was not very Back happy. Back to our little mate. Back to our little mate. So there is one story in, in uh, Constantin, Rel- Constantin Rilu. Uh, he was a Romanian man living in Turkey. He was declared dead by his wife so that she could remarry. He, he lost a court battle to declare that he was alive, which is great. Someone can just declare. No, him. no, no. So I'll tell I don't you, draw a line on many things that I like. No, no, I don't. No. And, and you know what? Ask for a divorce. Like seriously, you want to? You want to? <laughs> no, 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 no. Sometimes death is easier. You know, <laughs> it really is. So Lal Bahari, Lal Bahari, who I spoke to at the beginning. I will tell you now that this is a happy ending. So he had a fight. Oh, on I love him. a happy ending. He had his fighting. Oh, thank you. A fight on his hands. Um, what? As you know, the nature of bureaucracy in India. Is uh, is more British than the British ever, 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 ever were. Potentially, potentially. Well, the wheels no, of actually. justice grind slow, but they grind exceeding small. So Bihari mm. found at first 100 people and then up to 20,000 and formed what he called um, Mritak Sang, which means uh, the associ- Association of Dead People. Uh, they joined together and worked together <laughs> to, to try and help. Um, because one, firstly, they were in danger of being killed because, you know, once they're dead before the law, then people could mur- want, murder yeah. them uh, directly. Now, he tried a Did variety... Did you say 20,000? Uh, yes, 20,000 from all over India. Wow. So he tried a bunch of different things to draw attention to his, his means. He organised his own funeral. I'm not sure if he was lying in the coffin or not. Uh, he demanded his widow's pension. Uh, no, his, sorry, he demanded... Uh, with his wife, that she get a widow's pension because he was dead. And they said, no. Clever. They said, no, uh, I don't know what their justification was. He, you're alive. Here I am. No, you're not. I like, I like this one. He, he ran, well, not this one. Uh, these, these are boring. He ran for parliament. He added Maritak in, to his name. This is the one I like. He decided what he could do is he would insult police and government officials. He would throw pamphlets at them, try to engage them in fights, and also weirdly kidnap his uncle's child to entice them into arresting him. His theory was that once they arrested him, they had to admit he was alive. So, And could kill him. Indeed, indeed. Uh, that didn't help. But by 1994, uh, the district magistrate finally declared him to once again be alive. He did allow his uncle to continue farming on the land that he had stolen. And by 2004, the 20,000 members of the Indian Association of Dead People had managed Mm. to get four of their members declared alive. Victory. Four. That's your happy ending. <laughs> well, that's your happy ending. Okay. Well, Lal Bihari got he got he got declared okay. alive. Excellent. Is the magistrate a hero or a pariah for saying no? Actually, it turns out he's alive. How do you know? There he is. Like what? What he he, he got disbarred? 
I don't know. I don't know. The ah. fucking insanity. You're right. Okay, so when I get angry about filling in forms, I should have a little respect. At least you're still alive, technically. At least you are. Or have you seen the paperwork? (laughs) Think of the worst form you've ever filled out and just remember that. You are still technically alive. Yep. Yeah, I'm I'm now waiting to find out if I am. I'm not convinced. I haven't seen that paperwork. I, I, I do have a birth certificate, but that doesn't mean I'm still alive. The Wholesome Show is brought to you by the Australian National Centre for the Public Awareness of Science. I'm Will Grant. Awareness of life. We know that people who can talk are alive. Be alive. I'm Will Grant. He's Rod Lamberts. And thank you so much to Anna Greta Hunter for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. It's been great. See you next week, listener.